Young Democratic Socialist 2015 Toward an Intersectional Left took place on February 13 to 15, 2015 in New York City. Over 100 students from DSA and YDS chapters attended, including students from new chapters. Democratic socialists believe that both society and the economy should be run democratically to meet human needs, not to make profits for a few. This conference would not have been possible without support from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation here in New York and CUNY's Murphy Institute, which provided the wonderful venue space. Also thank the dozens of supporters that donated housing and funds to helping students travel and stay in New York, as well as the students and young adults that put time into putting together great panels and workshops that made the event a success. Every single speaker at the conference was a member of DSA talking about their own experiences and insights, and we're very proud of this as a member-run conference. I remember in an environmental studies class in high school, it was when I first began my hatred of big business <laughs> and um, realizing how exploitive it could be. And um, I didn't get a name to it until I came to college and met other YDSers and um, saw that their beliefs lined up with mine. Um, I like the ideas of socialism, definitely, and I've been reading up on communism, but I feel like for me it's a little too early to decide whether I'm deeply committed. A lot of political parties don't really focus on the issues that I take to heart, like for example, the disenfranchisement of African Americans in America. And I like how the last speaker like, ex especially decided to touch on that. I didn't even know that there were really many socialist movements in the United States until I started looking online and then I found DSA and that was the organization that I liked the most. Yeah, after that I decided that it would be really cool to start a chapter of YDS in my high school. Yeah, I was, I was drawn in. Um, all the facts were very enlightening, like Louis said. Um, yeah, just the combination of the hard-boiled facts that I think we often don't like to think about maybe even, but um, the way they deliver that in addition also kind of like, uh, you know, as a community, if we, if we work together, we, we can do something um, that yeah. hope and also comes along with it. Uh, that, it, really, it really got me uh, pumped, so to speak, <laughs> for this uh, condition. So I, I grew up in a very conservative family, an anti-union, conservative, reactionary family. Uh, in Queens, New York, actually, and I, in at around, two, I graduated high school in 2009, and I went. To, I decided to go to college, which was not exactly encouraged. I was thinking about becoming a, uh, an electrician and everything, and I decided to go to college. And my freshman year in college, we we're in the middle of the recession, and I had a course on Marxism. And I went into the course thinking this was, you know, totally BS. I wouldn't agree with any of this. It was just liberal professors, you know, spewing propaganda. And I left the course, and I was a socialist. I was very convinced, and I, and from that point on, I became very politically active. I'd never really been politically active before, um, and I just, I mean, I'm sure you've talked to other socialists. You just read and you learn more about the way things work in this country and in the world, and you learn more and more about how working people are just not empowered and we do not have a say in what goes on and most of our lives are not determined by sort of democratic processes and things like this but determined by what you know the one percent or the capitalists are uh, you know what they want. I've always considered myself very much a liberal very much you know on the left um, on most if not all issues um, but I, I was I didn't know too much about democratic socialism um, so I decided to come to a few meetings see what it was about and uh, yeah I would say that I, I certainly do now consider myself a, a socialist. I was lucky enough to meet a DSA organizer um, and saw them doing work that did resonate with me and that did touch on you know things that really had to do with my lived experience as you know um, a person who has lived in poverty um, as a working class person but then I was handed this book um, it, the book was called uh, Caliban and the Witch it's by a socialist feminist an Italian socialist feminist named uh, Silvia Federici um, and she's uh, she's a, um, a feminist Marxist 
who um, in that book walks through a lot of um, very central Marxist uh, uh, topics and analytical tools, but from a, a feminist perspective, and kind of you know challenges Marx a little and says, oh, you know, like maybe maybe you you could have gone a little farther here, or or maybe you know I need to help you out a little bit with this and. It, it really gave me um, a language that I had never had before for thinking about my, my, my personal experiences. Um, and as soon as that happened, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm a socialist. There, there, are, there are other people like me. I'm not just like, you know, this crazy person who's experiencing things that other people have never experienced before or, or you know, who's just, you know, interpreting you know her life all wrong you know um, so I mean for me there was like no resistance once I heard the term and um, saw it applied in a meaningful way for me I was just like this is what I am this is clear to me now should we be building an electoral machine or coalition to train socialists to run for office the majority of our work the majority of work of other socialists is not only is all, not electoral it's not the, the raison d'etre, as you'd say in French, the reason of being that we exist. We exist to make other socialists. I mean, I think the most important thing that ESA and groups I disagree with is to create and train people to be socialists because socialists are the most critical thinkers and fighters in movements of social change. We're not, we can't do it alone, but we provide a lot of intersectional analysis like we went over yesterday. We provide a critique of capitalism and connect it to other issues. I decided that I wanted to be an organized socialist when I turned 18 um, because I didn't want to just jump into anything in high school that was could be something I, I fleeting and I knew I was wise enough to know as high schoolers we go through trends so I waited. My dad really liked Michael Harrington who was the founder of DSA and he, they had worked together briefly because my father is a Chilean refugee and so DSA has been helpful with solidarity work to bring back Chilean democracy. So it was a great line that says everyone should start at least we should strive to have everyone have an equal base as much as possible and so that means like working not only in terms of economic injustice but also racial injustice other forms of oppression especially these days where we see around uh, the gay and lesbian community um, who aren't allowed to reach their full potential even in economic issues because they don't they're not afforded the same protection as other groups such as straights or whites um, and so that's what socialists are trying to achieve on those three angles. So like dem political democracy, economic democracy, and kind of equal and equality of opportunity to the extent that's possible. It's important to, uh, to uh, provide more nuance to the arguments that we're giving, right? Because when we have these kind of uh, race-centered critiques of mass incarceration, one, it's easy for neoliberal entities to, uh, to, you know, to kind of take that over and say, oh, okay, you have a, uh, we see this, this replicates itself through several uh, movements that are backed by identity politics. We see in a feminist movement, where they're like, okay, you have a problem with the way that women are treated in corporations, you have a problem with uh, uh, economic inequality, you can just lean in. That's all you need to do, right? Uh, if you have a problem with the way that uh, LGBTQ, the LGBTQ community is treated, that's all right. Okay, we'll uh, host parades that are sponsored by uh, alcohol companies, uh, where uh, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, people that are actually in the LGBTQ community are harassed by outsiders. Uh, it's you know, it's farcical. I mean, you're laughing, but it's true. This is what neoliberalism does. So it's important that whenever we are critiquing these systems that yes, affect uh, blacks and Latinos uh, particularly, we also point to critique of capitalism. After a lot of financial troubles while I was down at the University of Missouri, I had to come back and take a semester to work to gain money, to uh, make back money for, uh, you know, tuition and whatnot, housing. So while I was up here, I was like, you know, these are issues that I've been caring about, and so I started researching socialism. After a while, I was like, you know what, I really feel like I should do something about this, you know what I mean? And so I uh, basically Googled socialist organizations in the city of Chicago, and I was, and uh, DSA was the first one that popped up, so I emailed uh, uh, Bill Barkley uh, and Peg Strobel, who are some uh, DSA members out of Chicago, and they invited me to a, uh, an event, and it's just kind of been, you know, going on from there. How we see so the federal government's wonderful interest in protecting the welfare, being of Black and Latino people, and fighting drugs, fighting the drug trade. But uh, we know since the 40s, there's been uh, numerous congressional reports about this. The CIA is involved in drug trafficking all throughout the world. This started. In, 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 the, in the 40s in Italy, in post World War II Italy, working with the mob, with the communists who gained control, and uh, in 
pre Mao Zedong China during the Civil War, working with the nationalists, with huge, they controlled the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia. The CIA had a large role in that, and, and of course, in Central America in the 70s and 80s with the Contras. So we can see there's an obvious, obvious hypocrisy. The right always talks about the left saying we want equal outcomes. No, we just want equal opportunity. Because that's a false lie that's, that's said that exists in this society, that the American dream, everybody could prosper when they're clearly not happening. You have schools being underfunded, shut down, you know, short on staff, 30 kids in the classroom. Meanwhile, we got charter schools, you know, giving tests every year. And Martin Luther King said, you know, when you question why there are 40 million poor people in this country, you know, you question capitalism. And, and that's, that, you know, we're questioning capitalism. And we're offering a better plan for humanity. Whoever decides what the game is about decides who gets in the game. And I think that's a, that's a really important quote to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, political participation and how to engage more people. Whoever decides what the game is about decides who gets in the game. We have a system in which the Democrats and the Republicans vie for the votes of upper middle class people and respond almost exclusively to the demands of upper middle class people and wealthy people. And I don't think it's any surprise that in a system like that, working class people and people from oppressed communities would not participate in electoral politics.